Motion to see. Thank you. I call Denise Roche. Mr Chair, um, I rise to take a call on this part three. And this is, as other people have said, where the rubber hits the road. And it is the significant part of the bill which deals with worker participation, worker engagement, um, health and safety reps, health and safety committees, and as I said in one of my previous speeches, who's in and who's out. And it is in this part that we see the government's, uh, the government's experience of being lobbied coming into play in the legislation, and that's where we see the um, exemption from health and safety committees and reps for businesses with 20 or fewer than 20 um, workers, sir. Um, I've been thinking very seriously about what engagement means and what participation means, and reflecting on what the types of submissions were that we received. And we received many submissions in the Transport Industrial Relations um, Committee on the Health and Safety Reform Bill from employers who were really, really concerned that their that health and safety representatives would have too much power. Um, and they talked about the fact that um, health and safety reps could be uh, vindictive or they could use that power to, um, to basically shut down the plant or the, the operation for no good reason whatsoever. And in this part in the bill, there are some constraints around that. So this is quite a wide-ranging part of the bill, and I want to take several calls on this. So I'm just giving you notice, sir. I do want to take several calls on this to address some of those different aspects that are held within here, because it's quite, it's quite important and also wide-ranging. So first off, we've got the whole issue of engagement, and, um, and then following that, we've got the issue of participation. And um, it talks in the bill about what engagement means. And what I see engagement means is that um, it is supposed to be about ensuring that workers know what's going on, that they have the opportunity to be told what's going on, but not necessarily that they get the opportunity to speak back, although that talks, that's sort of covered a little bit further in participation. But what I've seen in my experience as a worker and as an employer is that frequently, um, telling people is not the same as engaging people. And for true participation, you actually need to have a two-way dialogue. And that is the balance that's being talked about um, in the model law, in the task force, uh, and in the recommendations from the Pike River, um, the Pike River Mine Royal Commission. So it seems to me that um, one of the ways that workers can participate is to elect a health and safety representative. And um, the fact that uh, for workplaces that have fewer than 20 workers don't have that right as of right um, means that that type of participation, that type of engagement and that type of voice has actually been silenced. And I guess that goes further when you look at also at health and safety committees, which are not required. A health and safety rep can ask for a, um, a health and safety committee to be set up, or in workplaces with over 20 workers, my understanding is that if more than five workers ask for a health and safety committee, then, then, then the employer, the PCBU rather, can consider it. the employer has the right to consider it. And also, the employer has the right to decline that. Um, and I note that there is a supplementary uh, order paper from the minister which sort of tries to soften that a bit by, by saying that actually the workers who would be affected by that have to be told. Great, they just have to be told. They don't have to be agreed with. Their request doesn't have to be met. They just have to be told. And actually, when you think about it, that's not really engagement as well. Now, sir, today I got an email from, um, uh, from a gentleman who had the dubious pleasure of being my boss 
for seven years. Um, and he's a volunteer, he was a volunteer then um, for the Waste Resource Trust on Waiheke Island. His name's George Blanchard. And um, the poor man, he was my boss for seven years and he was a volunteer. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. I call Rush. Mr. Chair. Denise Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, he actually wrote to me because he was a director of our community owned recycling and waste collection and processing company, which has a lot of heavy machinery. Um, the work site itself, which was owned by the council, was pretty dodgy, I have to say. And so it was frequent. Health and safety was a huge issue. And what he wrote to me with today was, and I'll, I'll quote it because it's a nice email, I've been thinking about the way safety was organised on the basically dangerous um, Clemstreen Waiheke Limited site. We had a completely unionised site with union members on the safety committee. When someone turned up in an unsafe state, it was the union rep, the health and safety rep, who asked them to go home and not to turn up in that state. This meant that the person knew that it was a request aimed at the safety of co-workers and not a vindictive approach by management. This might be a good model to explore. Tallies could learn something here if their management was capable of such a thing. And I am going to mention tallies under parliamentary privilege. I wouldn't dare to mention them outside. <laughs> um, basically because they have and they are taking a vindictive approach to workers who do want to have a voice or who have dared to, be, uh, to participate in union activities. Um, and they're doing this under the guise of um, uh, uh, during, during um, the breakdown of employment, employment collective agreement negotiations there. And I guess that's one of the things that worries me the, me the most, is the talk that we heard from some employers like Tally's during the select committee about this huge lack of trust, which I believe has actually filtered through into this iteration of the bill where it has changed the balance so that the employer gets to make a whole bunch of decisions, including in places where there may be a health and safety rep, what workers that representative will, uh, will cover, who they will represent, what work group they will represent. So, for example, if you had an employer who really didn't want to meet their obligations, they could quite easily say, well, this representative on this large work site will only represent this group of workers who are the admin workers, and let's forget about the ones in the warehouse. Now, it sort of de defeats the purpose of having a health and safety rep if that's the way you're going to, um, if, if that's the way an employer is going to operate. But, sir, it does happen, and we make law for the exceptions, for the bad cases. We make law to make sure that, um, that those sorts of uh, exploitations and the, the bad employment practices can be controlled. But, sir, what we are seeing is a complete watering down of the rights of workers to be able to actually say anything about health and safety. It does say in here that this is about ensuring that workers participate. But we've got a situation where the bill itself doesn't set up as of right situations where workers have that voice and outside of this bill and the rest of the legislation around employment relations, our, um, we've got a whole bunch of legislation that this government introduced which silences workers even more. And I will give you examples. There are things like um, the 90-day uh, the trial fire at will law. What that does is that new workers coming on are unable to raise their voice for fear that they won't be brought on again. And look, I realise further on in this bill, there is, um, in this part of the bill, there is some, um, some issues around, uh, around coercive and uh, around the behaviour to try and prevent that. But we've got this happening in other parts of employment relations and they are interconnected. If a worker can't speak in their first 90 days at work for fear that they may be sacked for no reason, then what hope have we got of them being able to raise any issues around 
you know, the deep fryer basically burning people on a regular basis and not having, um, not having any sort of bars, you know, uh, protective, protective bars to, to stop workers falling into it. I mean, we've come to a situation where that balance has absolutely changed the situation, sir. Uh, point of order. Uh, I just want... Uh, before I take the next call, I just want to um, acknowledge that a member has brought into the House a casket normally for the carriage of ashes. If she thinks she's going to use that as a visual aid at some later speech, the rules would require her to have it out of sight until she uses it. Um, if she is intending to use it for some other purpose, I fail to see how that is within order uh, in the House at the moment. And uh, so I would suggest at the moment that it be taken um, off the desk. Well, well, I suggest you take it down at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I can advise that currently I'm seeking some guidance from the clerk's office in respect of this, and it has been drawn to my attention that it is causing offence in the House. The question for the clerk's office is. Um, is it going to be seen as a visual aid or is it going to be uh, dealt with as a matter of offence for the House? If it is a visual aid, it then is open to the Chairman to decide whether or not is it appropriate for a visual aid or not, um, and that will be something that will be decided at a later time. If the member has a point to raise in respect of my comments, she may do that now. Uh, e te kai whakawā i tēnei wā, tino riri rawātua hau 